Welcome to another instructional video from OWL, the wise choice in fiber optic test equipment. I'm Professor Jim Powers. The goal of this video is to expose the viewer to the general idea behind testing optical fibers. Fiber optic professionals of all skill levels may find it beneficial to watch this video several times until these basic concepts are recorded into long-term memory and become second nature. After watching this video, the viewer will understand the value of being well-versed in fiber optics knowledge, understand why testing optical fibers is so important, understand the different levels of testing an optical fiber, be able to discern which types of tests are valid and which ones are not valid, understand the basic components and configuration of a properly designed fiber link, understand the basic procedure for properly testing a fiber link, and finally, be able to determine if a link is good or not. For many years now, optical fibers, thin strands of glass that carry information using light, have been the obvious medium of choice for many different communications applications. High bandwidth applications such as telecom, datacom, and video distribution harness the nearly unlimited bandwidth potential of optical fibers. Optical fibers electromagnetic immunity properties are especially attractive to energy, aerospace, and medical industries. The list goes on and on. Regardless of the application, fiber optics will be in the forefront of many industries' growth plans for the foreseeable future. Highly skilled and knowledgeable experts are needed to fuel this growth. By becoming an expert in the field of fiber optics, you will become an invaluable asset to your company. You will be able to recognize emerging fiber optics technologies and trends, know when a new technology will add value to your company's products and or services, and understand how to implement this new fiber optics technology. Immersing yourself in daily study by staying abreast of the advancements in fiber optic technologies will truly make you a valuable expert in your field. Once a fiber optic cable has been installed, the fiber cable may or may not work right away. However, if the fiber cable is first tested with a positive result before the active equipment is connected, Rest assured that connectivity problems will not be the fault of the fiber cable itself. In addition, the test should also indicate that the fiber cable is operating with sufficient safety margin so that network communications will be maintained even in the event of minor issues related to slight changes in the environment, such as temperature, humidity, or dust. Eliminating network downtime is of particular interest in applications that involve safety concerns. For example, Oil companies use optical fibers to monitor the pressure of undersea oil wells. Failure to operate with sufficient safety margin here might mean that alerts are not received in time to prevent the well from bursting. Many commuter jets now install optical fibers for control and monitoring systems. Airlines must ensure that their optical fibers will work just as well in the frigid cold of the upper atmosphere as they do on the ground where it is relatively warm. Otherwise, the controls could fail and result in catastrophe. Many fire alarm systems are now being installed using optical fibers for communications. So whether the network is only used for email and internet or for life safety concerns, they should all be tested properly. This is absolutely critical for ensuring link quality. As we have just discussed, proper testing of optical fibers ensures the quality and reliability of an optical fiber link emphasizing the word proper because some test methods do not give any indication of the quality of the fiber link. Understanding exactly what a particular test is doing goes a long way in making sure you make the right recommendations to your company and your customers. Up to this point, the word testing has been generally applied to a group of procedures used to determine the ability of optical fiber to carry light. In reality, testing in this context can actually be broken down into two main categories, test and measurement. Most people consider these words to be synonymous, but they are not, and here's why. A test simply checks for the presence of something, such as, it is hot outside, while a measurement tells you exactly how much that something you have. It is over 100 degrees outside. Keep this in mind as we proceed. As an expert in this industry, it is important to understand the difference between a fiber optic test and a fiber optic measurement, as well as being able to determine whether a simple test is sufficient or if you need to perform a measurement. 
There are two basic categories of optical fiber testing, which coincidentally fall along the lines of test versus measurement, continuity-based tests, and optical power-based measurements. Continuity is considered a test because continuity simply checks for the presence of light in an optical fiber, while optical power is considered a measurement because the actual amount of optical power is being determined. Put another way, a fiber optic test can be performed without measuring anything, but a fiber optic measurement cannot be performed without continuity. Continuity is simply looking for the visual presence of optical power, such as with a flashlight or visual fault locator. However, just because light is making it to the end of a fiber does not mean the fiber is good. Even a shattered fiber will pass light, and the human eye would have difficulty telling the difference between a good fiber and a bad one. Go no go is done by connecting communications equipment to a fiber link. Either it goes or it doesn't. A common go no go test would be connecting two computers to a fiber link and copying a file back and forth. Qualification is just another form of go no go, but in this case the qualification tester takes the place of the computers. A qualification tester goes a step further by copying predefined data bit patterns across the link at different data rates and determining if any bit errors occurred. Even though an argument could be made that a bit error measurement is being performed, a bit error measurement cannot tell you how close you are to failing and thus cannot be used to determine link quality. Optical power is a measure of exactly how bright the light is that exits an optical fiber as compared to a known baseline called a calibration standard. In the U.S., the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, maintains the official 1 milliwatt standard. Power meters that are NIST calibrated provide assurance that the power measurement is accurate. Optical loss is a measure of how much weaker a link got as it traveled across the fiber link. Too much signal loss and the link will not work. Optical loss can be compared to a link budget to determine how much safety margin the link has. Fiber link certification builds upon optical loss by calculating a link budget according to official set of rules called standard. Application standards provide a fixed link budget based on that particular application, such as Ethernet, while generic standards provide per unit values for the various passive components of the link, such as optical fiber, interconnections, and splices, for the purpose of calculating an overall link budget. Obviously, measurements are more thorough than simple tests, and thus measurements should always be performed when determining link quality when applied to fiber optics testing. The components considered as part of a properly designed fiber link include the following. Optical fiber is the actual communications medium that carries optical signals from one end to the other. Optical fibers are classified as either single mode or some type of multi-mode. Interconnections are temporary junction points between two connectors temporary because they are designed to be disconnected and reconnected at will. Interconnections are not to be confused with connectors. Common names for interconnections are mating sleeve, bulkhead, adapter, and coupler. Interconnections can be found in patch panels, wall outlets, or mid-span when using a centralized optical fiber link design. Splices are permanent or semi-permanent junction points between two segments of non-connectorized optical fiber. Once a fiber link is spliced, it is not meant to be disconnected. Splices can be one of two types. Mechanical, where two bare fibers are brought together and index matching gel placed between the fibers to eliminate the air gap between the fibers. Or fusion, where the two fibers are melted together with a device called a fusion splicer. Proper link design includes patch panels on both ends of the fiber link. This is done so that fragile optical fibers are not directly connected to active equipment. Rather, ruggedized patch cables provide the final connection between the patch panel and active equipment. Testing a fiber optic cable is not much different than other cable measurement methods, where two units, a transmitter and receiver, are connected to patch panels on opposite ends of the link to take a measurement. With fiber optics, this is done with a test kit containing a light source and an optical power meter. The light source shines light into one end of the fiber and the power meter measures the light at the other end. However, this type of measurement is only meaningful when you know exactly how much light you started with. 
To measure the starting value, simply connect the power meter and light source together with a short segment of optical fiber called a patch cable, usually one meter long, and record the value, a process which we call setting a reference or zeroing. Optical fiber measurements are usually expressed in units called decimals, which can be somewhat confusing to beginners since fiber measurements are often shown as negative numbers. Just to keep it simple, when a decibel value is negative, it just means that the light being measured is dimmer than a baseline power level. Consider this helpful illustration. Picture a facility with ground level being floor zero. The floors below ground are given negative numbers, so floor minus 20 would be 20 levels below the ground floor. If you start at floor 20, then take an elevator to floor minus 24, then you have dropped four levels. Relating this example back to decibels. Let's say you started with minus 20 decibels through a short patch cable, remembering that a negative value sim simply means the light is dimmer, then measured minus 24 decibels after connecting the testers to opposite sides of the link. In all, the signal has dropped 4 decibels, which is to say that the fiber link has 4 decibels of loss. Now, you might be asking yourself, how do I know if 4 decibels is a good reading? The answer is, it depends. Each link will have a different configuration and thus will have a different allowable loss limit. There are three main parts to a fiber optic link that contribute to the total allowable loss number. The first part is the optical fiber itself. The main thing to remember here is that the longer the fiber, the more loss will occur. For example, a 200 foot link will have more allowable loss than a 100 foot link. Optical fiber loss values are given in decibels per kilometer. The second part of the fiber link are interconnection points such as patch panels, wall outlets, or other mating sleeves. The proper term for these connections is mated pair since you are mating a pair of connectors together. Connection loss is given in decibels per mated pair. The third part of a fiber link that contributes to loss is a splice. A splice is different from a mated pair in that two fibers are being brought together without the use of connectors. There are two types of splices, mechanical and fusion. Splice loss is given in decibels per splice. Add together your fiber loss plus connection loss plus splice loss and you end up with your total allowable loss for that link, which is also called a link budget. Organizations such as the TIA, IEEE, and ISO develop sets of rules called standards that are used to determine your link budget. In most cases, the TIA standard is the best option. So, once you know how far you did fall, in other words, the loss rating, and how far you can fall, in other words, the link budget, there are two possible results. Good, or the loss reading is within the link budget, which can also mean pass, or not good. The loss reading exceeds the link budget, which can also mean fail. When you get a pass reading, you can say that the fiber link has been certified using the chosen standard. Certification is the best way to assure the quality of the fiber link installation. In addition to determining pass-fail, you can also see how close you are to the pass-fail threshold. This gives you assurance that the fiber link is operating with enough safety margin to overcome slight changes in the environment or small bits of dust that may have collected on fiber connectors. This has been another instructional video from OWL, the wise choice in fiber optic test equipment. For more instructional videos or to learn more about OWL's products in general, please visit owl-inc.com. I'm Professor Jim Powers. Thanks for watching.